I'm Duncan Davidson. This is about founders' lessons learned. There's a lot of founders here. These folks all come from different experiences and have gone through the wars, and they're going to impart some of their learning. There's a range of companies here. Aaron was a founder of Living Social, which, as you may know, fought Groupon all the way up, got bought by Amazon. So he's had the exit. Uh, Marcelo over here started Ipsy, uh, which is a fabulous company that's been growing on internal cash flow 3x year on year. Hope you guys can all accomplish that. Uh, Matt is doing 2020. I thought it was the largest stock photo library, but it's almost the largest. But he's growing this company in LA. Josh is from WAG, WAG Walking, Uber for Dog Walking. What a fabulous idea. And then Alex came all the way from New York to share his knowledge. He's a Giphy, which spun out of Betaworks, which is the leading source of GIFs. And he tells me they don't pronounce it GIF anymore, it's GIFs. With that, what I'd like to do is have each of them introduce more about their company and what was the, the idea that led to their initial founding of the company. Aaron, do you want to start us off? Sure. Uh, Living Social started as four guys building Facebook apps in 07. Uh, for a year or so, we grew to about 100 million users, built an ad targeting platform that looks a lot like social ads, um, later built a few different companies uh, inside of the company, shut down most of them, bought a company that did online to offline commerce that later turned into a social commerce that you guys probably all know. Uh, over the next 18 months, grew from 40 employees to 4,000, raised hundreds of millions of dollars, grew to 30 countries, sold billions of dollars of local experiences around the world. Um, I left a few years ago and I'm now on the, I guess, dark side with you. Uh, I'm a VC at Lightspeed. Aaron, um, I am your father. Yeah, uh, you're old <laughs> enough to be my father, but um, <laughs> uh, And now I help companies from the other side of the table. Yeah, but I have more hair than he does. That's true. <laughs> I'll stop, but I couldn't, I don't have to. After you. Oh, Giphy. So Giphy is the, the world's largest gift search engine, and it started as a, just a simple idea um, where a friend and I were at coffee, and we just couldn't find gifts. So we went to Google, and we looked for gifts, and Google didn't... There's no way to find gifts on Google, and we, we thought that was kind of impossible. So we, we noticed that no one had actually had a gift search engine, so we spent some time and just built our own, and then we launched it, and now we do... We have 75 mil million unique visitors a month. We do 400 million page views. Our API does about 5 billion API requests a month, and that doubles about every three months. So we are now the biggest GIF uh, platform on the internet. Cool, Josh, CEO of WAG. Uh, before WAG, I did a social gaming company. I remember uh, Living Social's uh, top five. Pick five. Pick yeah. five uh, service. After that, I did a social dating company, and. When I was trying to figure out what I want to do next, I was aggressively trying to find and adopt a dog, and both my brother and my parents were convincing me not to, that I didn't have the time, and I was using Postmates and Uber and all these other services at the time, and noticed there was nothing to make it easier to own a dog, so I decided to launch WAG, which is like Uber for dog walking, and dog walking is kind of our gateway drug into all the other services that you can do for the dog, and you know, you can think of WAG as the, the button on the, the phone uh, for the paw. And we're now, you know, the largest dog walking service in, in the U.S. and we're just one year since launching, or 10 months since launching. Thank you. Um, my name is Marcelo. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ipsy. Ipsy is the world's most passionate beauty community. Um, my background's not in beauty. It's working with... Uh, online video and more Hollywood celebrities and subsequently uh, started working a lot with YouTube personalities and met uh, my co-founder Michelle Fon. And I don't know how many of you have heard of Michelle Fon. Raise your hands. Okay, a few of you. Okay, good. She's um, the world's largest beauty personality on, uh, or most viewed beauty personality on YouTube. And uh, she was seeing that people were coming, especially millennials, were coming to her channel instead of to traditional magazines or to the makeup counter to discover new beauty products and new looks. And so we thought that that was really going to transform the entire beauty industry and that that was the beginning of something very, very big. And uh, we decided that the best way to enter the market and take advantage of this real shift in influence from magazines to these online influencers was to begin with um, a subscription business 
and we started that in December 2011, and uh, we're now uh, have over one and a half million subscribers, and are the largest uh, beauty subscription service out there. Uh, so my name is Matt Munson. I'm one of the founders and CEO at 2020. Uh, we are the fastest growing stock photo service in the world that you probably have not yet heard of, uh, which is super cool. So we, what we observed early on um, was that the, the iPhone and similar devices had really changed both creation and consumption patterns. So you've got a billion photos being created today on mobile devices, and you've got people creating apps, websites, and ads um, that have a need for content that feels nascent inside of mobile. And so we have built a, um, one of the largest stock photo catalogs in the world sourced entirely off of mobile. Um, we've got a catalog of about 50 million images. So we've outgrown iStock and Shutterstock even though we just launched the service in February of this year. And we help customers like Google, Uber, Birchbox, Microsoft, and others source content that performs well inside of social and mobile. Okay, thank you. Uh, post seeds about post product market fit. I mean, John Doerr said that Series A is the most important thing in the universe. We actually think that it's really, really important if you hit the market, what you do with it. Do you have product market fit? How do you build a real company? Do you pivot? That seems to be the epic moment in most founders' sort of lives. So I want to go back to everybody and talk about what happened when the product first hit the market, why you shifted your business. So, Matt, you came to us as InstaCanvas, Canvas Art from Instagram. You had a huge number of people sign up to sell Canvas Art from their, their wonderful pictures. And then you decided there was a deeper business. Can you explain what you learned, what people can learn from your experience hitting this post-product market fit scenario? <laughs> yeah, sure, absolutely. So we launched our very first service uh, called Instant Canvas. And again, we had observed this phenomenon that you had all this creation of uh, digital imagery. And, and it was kind of all created, shared in social, and then would die off. And we thought there was a lot of value there that wasn't being captured. So about two and a half, three years ago, we launched our first product called InstaCanvas, which let you sign up and sell your Instagram photos as a piece of wall art that we would print and send to your friends. And it was a little bit of an accidental business. Um, we, uh, we, we had built another product for about three months that wasn't working, we're running out of cash. Uh, had this idea uh, and the Instagram API had just opened up. And so we kind of built the service on a Friday afternoon. It was a kind of a very simple four static web pages that we put up and uh, had, a, had a nice viral hook where you could invite your friends uh, via Instagram and Facebook. And uh, as fate would have it, the thing blew up over the weekend and we signed up our first like 5,000 users uh, by Sunday morning. Uh, and then realized, shit, like now we actually have to build this business um, and we're not sure exactly what it looks like. So the first business, uh, when we met the bullpen guys, um, we were about three months into that and had actually built the e-commerce platform to uh, let people sign up, upload, and sell their photos. Uh, built that business um, out for about a year and then began to realize that in, in building that business, we had amassed the, the largest crowdsourced commercial image catalog in the world um, and started to have some inbound interest from brands and agencies that were interested in licensing the content for other purposes. Uh, had a bit of an aha moment there where although we were, um, you know, had just exceeded a million dollar run rate on the consumer business that we were kind of being idiots um, and we're sitting on a much larger B2B opportunity, um, which we uh, went through a, a, a pretty large pivot and have been pursuing now for about the last year and a half. Marcelo, when you first came to us, we heard your story as QVC on YouTube, where in effect you had celebrities like Michelle, stunning celebrities that had this huge audience watching on YouTube for free and you were monetizing. But what you've developed is a much deeper and more profound insight. Can you explain how you went from the first to the second? Or maybe it's us who weren't keeping up with you. No, I, I, don't, I, don't, think it's, I don't think it's you guys. It's, it's, it's me, it's not you. Um, <laughs> so I think when, what we realized is that the shift that was going on was much broader than what had allowed us to grow so effectively on the subscription service there was something a lot deeper happening. And it's, it's, it's happening not just in beauty, but in other industries as well, where if you ask a lot of millennials where they get their, their beauty advice from or where they find products, they'll tell you that they found it either from a friend or the number one choice, the number one, number two thing that they'll say is from watching uh, somebody that I follow on YouTube or on Instagram and now increasingly Snapchat. So that shift is a really fundamental shift in the beauty industry, because beauty is um, it's built around newness, so there's new products coming out all the time, 
um, thousands and thousands every year. And so whoever really has a con control over that awareness, um, we believe will be able to really have influence over the $75 billion industry in the US and a much, much bigger industry around the world. So we just, you know, we, it, it was really just a natural transition for us about what was the broader thing that, the broader impact that we were having on an industry and not just a tactic which is really selling something through video. Now that makes sense. Just as a comment, what Marcelo's been teaching Bullpen is that going after these old line businesses, in his case is going after beauty and retail, or going after transportation, or for example dog walking, these are enormous businesses that have not yet been well tapped. So we actually are thinking a lot about investing in those areas versus tech for techie. So Josh, you launched WAG and almost immediately you had product market fit. You've had actually a stunning straightforward growth story. So what did you learn though as you were developing the company in the market and what are you doing right now to improve the company? Yeah, I mean I think the one of the key learnings was pre-launch, you know, asked a bunch of people about, you know, the idea if they, you know, would you know, want someone to just walk their dog, you know, on demand, let someone into your house when, when you're not there and kind of change the behavior and a lot of people said no. Um, so one of the key word learnings was, you know, you really have to follow what you believe is correct and you can change behavior. Um, and we launched and, you know, as, you know, as Duncan said, you know, in the first month we, you know, had product market fit in LA and um, for us, you know, the probably key learning for us was that there's so much differences between like when you launch and something's working to when it actually like reaches scale and you have that liquidity tipping point the the business like literally like switches 180 degrees and all the problems that you thought you were solving totally change and it's very difficult because you can't understand or solve those problems until you reach that sort of scale on both sides of the marketplace so it's like how do you keep your you know, business efficient and your customer experience getting better over time while you're fulfilling more demand and more dog walkers, et cetera. I'd say that was one of the, the key learnings for us. So Alex, I know your, your basic move has gone from being on the web to being on mobile. Can you talk a bit about that transition and what you've learned? Yeah, so we started on the web and, you know, we were the first gift search engine and by far the largest. And uh, we noticed over time that about 40 to 50% of our traffic was going mobile. And this is, you know, this is pretty obvious for everyone. Everyone's in text messaging, everyone's messaging on Snapchat. So we started focusing on mobile products. Actually, from, since the very beginning, we were in, our API was in most of the mobile web apps. GroupMe was our first integration three years ago. Uh, a lot of the other messaging apps started integrating us. So we started focusing primarily on mobile because we knew that mobile was going to be the future of where people were texting and gifts were the perfect medium to share within a text message. If you're ever trying to get media within a text conversation, it's pretty much impossible. YouTube videos are too slow, texts are kind of boring. So gifts are kind of the perfect medium to, to, to not only send media in and entertainment, but also in the future advertising and revenue. So that's something that we've been taking a lot of time uh, curating and, and working on. So Aaron, uh, as you said, Living Social started as a different company that pivoted into the Groupon space. It wasn't clear to me what drove your pivot. Was it just chasing Groupon, or did you guys somewhat simultaneously come up with a new business model? We, in 2009, we bought a company called BiFad, which uh, we had this massive audience online, on, mostly on Facebook, as, as you mentioned, uh, that we acquired building all these apps, and we had PII, we had interest data, that's the product that we were building before. And BiFad was, a, was in the sampling space. So we, sampling meaning beer, wine, and spirit sampling. We had POS software that integrated with our website that took this online audience into bars and restaurants to sample beer, wine, and spirits. And Vive or Absolute would pay us $5 a head for a guy to go in or a girl to go in and try a new flavor of vodka. Uh, we had a local sales team. They'd stop by every bar, walk past a spa, stop by another bar, and we quickly converted that to a social commerce model and kind of leveraged the same sales team that we acquired through that acquisition to go after local commerce. It all started with vodka. Like it that. did, okay. yeah. Uh, it always starts with vodka. <laughs> Which I don't even, is that still around? Beef vodka? I don't know. I, we have one yeah. guy in our group who loves vodka deals. I'll ask uh, we'll talk. We'll talk later. All right, so I'm going to go back and, and go into some of the things you're learning right now. So Marcelo, uh, 
you're scaling really fast. What has been your biggest issue and how are you trying to solve it? Our, our biggest issue has been hiring by far. Um, so part of that stems from um, being essentially a bootstrap company. Um, we raised less than $3 million and with that um, got to over $150 million in revenue. Now we've raised a ton of money, so I can't really uh, blame it on, on, on uh, being bootstrapped anymore. Um, we just raised a $100 million round. But uh, be before that, we had raised less than $3 million. And the, the, the biggest challenge, I would say, was going from somewhere in the 40, 50 employee range to 150. Um, and so, you know, Duncan suggested that I talk a little bit about kind of those challenges that we had and they were all over the place and if you are a founder and you're anything like me um, you're very reactionary around hiring um, so especially at the beginning most of us have somewhat of a network where we can find those first 20 30 em employees team members um, we can also really, you know, be part of the hiring process and we can just play it a little bit more by ear. I think the biggest realization for us and when things really improved is where we set up a really, really rigorous process around recruiting. Everything from, you know, pipeline management and where we posted jobs. Um, that's probably more of the obvious one, but all, all the way to how we interviewed, how we made offers how we set up um, our, our, our job requirements, who we interviewed, and, um, and of course, who manages the whole process. So one of the things that we didn't do until too late was to have somebody that was, you know, uh, head of HR or head of recruiting. Um, I think, I, you know, certainly with the environment a year ago, maybe that'll change. I, I think it's critical as you're scaling to have somebody who is smart, who understands recruiting or, or can get up to speed quickly on, on, on uh, setting up a recruiting process and then managing that and measuring every single part of it. So I think that was probably one of the biggest challenges in um, the way that we were able to overcome it is really just through being rigorous and measuring everything and, and, and setting up a, a process around everything. Alex, I know you're in the middle of the same scaling tornado. Do you want to comment on what you've learned about recruiting? Are you measuring? Stuff oh yeah, like so that? yeah, right in New York. If you're if you're a VC in New York or a company in New York, it's almost impossible to hire anyone. So it's it's really hard. We've tried for years to hire some good talent, and mostly it comes from the first 30 comes from friends and referrals. But what we've noticed, the best way is to just let wait for the companies that are currently established to die. And then you kind of come in as vultures, and all the good company, and then all the good employees will come to you. Because that, most people who started the, at those companies were startup people. They wanted to be a part of the young, small startup crowds. And that's the advantage of most founders right now, is the big established companies, now that they've grown up, that's not the same job that you had when there were 30 people. Now it's a different company when there's 150 people. Those people that were a part of the original 30, they probably don't want to be there. They want to be someplace else. And so if you have good opportunity, that's a perfect time that to recruit from these companies that have grown to scale. So Tumblr is a gift that keeps giving. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Somebody laughed. I like that. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Right, on the recruiting point, I think it also depends on what kinds of people you're recruiting. Yeah. Um, when we recruited product and engineering folks, we definitely had to, we also had thousands of salespeople in the field in every city. Uh, a, an early story from our growth was that when we were just 20 or 30 people, we had sort of unique ways to acquire users online, leveraged our user act channels to do resume aggregation in literally hundreds of cities across the US, uh, had phone screens to interview people every week, and then we flew in 100 people a week into the DC airport where we were based. My engineers, early product people, interviewed these salespeople every week. Oh. By three in the afternoon, <laughs> half of them were let go. By 6 p.m. that night, we had hired 12 to 20 people in 20 markets. Uh, and we repeated that weekly for probably 10 weeks. And through that process, literally hired hundreds of people across the country. Um, so a little scrappy, but it did work to get, get those salespeople, yeah. get that two-sided marketplace. We needed the content, we needed the salespeople. Um, so that was we have a We idea. have a totally backward hiring process in that. 
So, so we, that's just salespeople. You guys are a pioneering <laughs> oh yeah, company. Salespeople. We can talk yeah, about we don't even, engineering. We don't even think about salespeople. We, yeah. we have a road trip philosophy where if people come in and, and it, we have this road trip test. And this is how if anyone who has a company under 30 people, you should totally do this. Is if you don't think you can road trip with this person, you shouldn't hire them, even if they're the best person, the best salesperson. Because you're like a startup, you're in a sweaty room with a bunch of people 12, 18 hours a day. You've been there. I'm, I'm sure all of you have been there. If you can't road trip with this person and they're annoying you because they have some weird mannerism or like tick that you just can't deal with, like don't start a startup with them. Don't hire them. You need to be like startups are, a, it's more like a band. It's, it's, it's about your friends. It's about the people that you're going to make art with. And that's kind of the way we approach it. So yeah. we don't hire salespeople. Yeah, you don't have, it's slightly different. <laughs> Not yet. At some point, we'll have to. For people that were at HQ, our interview process was very different. I want to ask you guys a real time um, question for one of the deals we're looking at. So one of the things Josh did was a swipe. It was like Tinder for dating and you know, left, right. Um, you see the whole thing out, somebody goes like that in the street, it doesn't work in the real world. So, question for you guys, if there was a Tinder for job postings, like, don't like, 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 don't like, where the person is looking at job postings, which ones they like, and you do the same thing, would that have helped you in some of your scaling problems? Marcelo, are you looking like, no, <laughs> it wouldn't have helped. I, I think, you know, it's, it's all about process, so it's, it's one other channel. Maybe we maybe would have helped us at the margin, but the most important thing is, and uh, just setting up your job requirements right first of all, which most people don't do, or at least we didn't do. So then we were like, well, should we hire this person or not? You know, do they actually meet all these requirements? But then there's something else that was really in the back of your mind that you didn't put in there that was really what you cared yeah. about. And I, so I, I know Alex, you're going to say something. Oh, no, I, t I don't think that will ever work because Tinder is, everyone knows Tinder is about hooking up. It's not about dating long term. So if you, if there is no Tinder for friends. You're not going to pick your long term friends and your best buddies on Tinder. You're going to do this for like a hookup. And so if you're hiring people, you don't want a short term hookup. You want, you want best friends. And that's the way to hire. So yeah, it totally won't work. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Aaron, would that work for you no, guys? No, I, I, don't, I don't think it would work. Um, especially. Uh, early on, there's too much importance in spending time with the people. We, ha we made sure everyone that we hired at the beginning we worked with for an actual period of time before we hired them. Um, because interviews are just one way to get to know someone. Seeing how they work, seeing what they produce, whether they're a graphic artist or whether they're a designer or programmer, UX person, like I need to see what you create. And I need to see how we work together when we create those things. Um, it's very different than just having a conversation or looking at a portfolio. So let me or ask you guys a different question. Uh, most of you are in marketplace style businesses where it's a winner take most end game. And I know with, with Giphy, you probably think you're there right now. Well, Aaron, you went through the same thing fighting Groupon. So let's start with Alex. How do you actually own the category? How do you become the category? So, so when, when, we were, when we were thinking about Giphy, no one had actually owned the gift space. It was kind of a greenfield. So the first thing we did was we set about owning the actual term GIF, GIFs. We wanted to be brand. Brand was the first thing we did. And so if you search for GIFs, Giphy is the first search result. Pretty much anything you search for GIF, Giphy is the search result. So for the history of the internet from now on, we claim that stake. Anytime anyone from your kids, anytime they send a GIF, they'll, they'll search for Giphy and they'll find, you know, they'll search for GIFs and they'll find Giphy. So anything that comes out with GIFs, pretty much anytime anyone uses a GIF, it's associated to Giphy. So the first thing was just owning the brand, just like Kleenex did, Xerox did. The second one is, which is a little counterintuitive, is we partnered with everyone. So we, we didn't see anyone as a competitor. We made deals with Tumblr. We made, tried to be, make deals with Imager. Anyone that was there, we did five GIF acquisitions last year. We will work with anyone that is working in the GIF space because as the GIF space gets bigger, so, so do we. And so we see everyone as a partner. And there's never been a situation where we've turned down anyone as, uh, as a partner. And so the last thing is just our product is we're super product focused. Our product is just better than everyone's. And ultimately, it comes down to product. If your product isn't good, it doesn't really matter about owning the space. Someone will come in and be better. So you, you have to be product focused first. Josh, you want to comment on this? You're at least trying to own cities that you build up. Yeah, for us, it was you know, important early on to own the pillar cities, so like Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and LA. And those are really important. The other cities, less important, because 
really wanted to perfect experience. So for us, you know, we made sure early on in our first six months that we were the leaders in the four cities very quickly. And I think that was also very helpful for us and purposely did it because we wanted to learn, you know, how to roll out a city and what are the different economics and marketplace dynamics on a per city basis and how to scale operationally um, in each city. I think at the end of the day though, it really comes down to experience and winning the experience. Like when you have a marketplace, people are going to use whatever is the best experience, whether it's Uber, it's going to be like what's going to get there fastest and be the cheapest and provide me the best experience with dog walking, who's going to provide me the best dog walk, the most convenient, the one that's most reliable. And having that liquidity tipping point is probably the most key thing in our business. Um, and that's what allows you to own the category is having the liquidity tipping point because it's such a, our marketplace is so difficult because it's like on demand walks I need right now, I need something later today, I need something tomorrow, I need a recurring schedule. So it's like a, almost like a five-sided type of uh, scheduling system marketplace where you need to have liquidity tipping point for all those different things across different cities and that's how you own the categories, you own the experience. Yeah. I, I agree you with both Josh. You, both you guys are agreeing on product. Yeah, I agree, I agree with Josh also. Um, if you look at a company like Netflix, which is a company we, we look at a lot, I mean, I think not anybody, but there's the, the barriers to securing a bunch of content and creating a distribution platform for that content. That anybody can do it, um, but they have done so many little things to improve that experience over time. Um, and that's how we've been winning, is just getting better and better and better. I think we're still not even good, you know, I tell people we're okay, you know, if you, if we look at where Ipsy is versus where Netflix was four years into their business, you know, Netflix was a business that, back then it was like, hey, I'd use Netflix if I'm into movies, I'm a movie aficionado, now everybody uses it, you know, and maybe with Josh it's the same, like, hey, you know, um, if you have a dog, why wouldn't you use WAG, because I don't know what it is that they're providing, but that's what we want to do for beauty. <laughs> Why wouldn't you use it? See, but that just, it's incremental improvements. I don't think it's as much a winner take all, take all in that sense, because I think other people will be able to be there. But if you have the best experience, that's hard to uh, overcome. And so, something that may be helpful, particularly to the earlier stage founders in the room, is that it's it's, it's, it's really overwhelming to think about being a category owner on day one when you're two or three people sitting in a room. Um, and so we're big fans of thinking about like what's the niche that we can own today? And we're in a space where we've got multi-billion dollar incumbents that we're going up against. And when we can, when one of our salespeople can get on the phone and talk to one of their customers and explain for the particular use cases where we're much better, we get a foothold in an organization and then grow because of a better product. Sometimes it's an easier place to start. So start with owning a niche, build a better product, build better channels, and then figure out how to be kind of the, the uh, category owner as you grow up. Very good. We have about two minutes left. Does anybody have a burning question in the audience for a group here? If you do, you belt it out. Anybody? <laughs> okay, let me go to one other topic, uh, which is, Living Social had a problem going global, which is there was a clone in every little port. Well, how did you guys deal with that, scaling out of the U.S. into the rest of the world? Yeah, there were, uh, there were probably, I don't know what the count was, it was something like 6,000 companies in the space. Uh, really only two companies raised 99% of the funding. Um, a lot of this was about uh, user acquisition and unique sales strategies. Um, I think one of the lessons learned as you scale internationally is to really understand every market because every culture, every country is different. And we were interacting with local businesses which all had nuances, uh, as well as online commerce, which also has nuances per country. Uh, when we had direct teams in those regions managing those countries from the inside, we were much more successful. Um, some we did through acquisition, some we did organically. Uh, but those were definitely the lessons learned. Like respect the local culture, the local people, uh, and treat it in many ways like another company, um, and you're more likely to succeed. Marcelo, you raised your money in part to expand internationally. What have you learned so far in the product? If you've gone very far expanding internationally, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a fair question? <laughs> it's been two months. So. Yeah. Nothing yet. Um, 
Alex, are you international yet? Uh, we, we support 40 languages right now. Uh, we are also working on deals right now to go international across all the gifts. So gifts are pretty universal, which is the amazing thing about it. So we're, we'll soon be in South America, Europe, uh, Asia, and we'll import all of the media there and provide it locally for the, uh, the current locales. So that'll happen early Q2 next year. Very good. Time's up, guys. Thank you very much.